Hello, host. Hi, welcome back. So uh, case number 13 with me is uh, Ilona doing the TE and Katja doing the case history. Please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Siebert. An overview of the next case, a 77-year-old male with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. In April this year, he had gastrointestinal bleeding under rivaroxaban and clopidogrel. Hemoglobin was 6, requiring transfusion. Gastroenterologist recommends LAA closure. His current clinical symptoms are loss of appetite. His past medical history includes coronary artery disease with PCI in March this year, peripheral artery disease with PTA stent in 2011, chronic ischemic colitis with multiple stenosis and stent celiac truncus in March this year, hypertension, diabetes, and polyneuropathy. ECG showed uh, sinus rhythm, TTE and TEE showed moderate LA dilatation, mild mitral, tricuspid, and pulmonary valve insufficiency, moderate concentric LV hypertrophy, and diastolic dysfunction, LV ejection fraction of 68%, systolic pulmonary pressure of 37 millimeters of mercury. Risk scores were calculated, Chad Vask score was 5 and has bleed 3. Thank you. Back to Professor Sievert. Thank you very much. So I have a, a transeptal sheath is in the groin and the TE is in, and Ilona will show us the uh, images she already recorded. Ilona, hmm? show us the images, please. Mm -hmm. So this is about, what degree is that, 45 degree? And we have a uh, measurement of the ostium is L1, is that? Uh, 20, 20 millimeters. 20 millimeters at the ostium. And then yeah. at the landing zone, how much do we have there? I can't read it. Um, this one is the landing zone, a and uh, this is um, 18 millimeters. 18 and 17 is the other one, no? OK. Yeah. And 17 also, the other uh, plane is one of them, 35 degree. OK. Anything else you already have recorded? 3D, OK. 3D. And there we see 16 by 19 millimeter, OK. Okay, okay, that's it. Any questions so far regarding indication or the echo findings? Well, I'll turn to the panelists, to the adult interventionist, Professor Cook. Yeah, of course. I mean, this is uh, um, a patient where I also would consider to close the left atrial appendage. The only question, of course, comes up if this lady is otherwise in good shape and she's in sinus rhythm now, uh, what one would do in addition in ablation? Uh, for treating paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. She's not in permanent atrial fibrillation, so I think th this is a treatable uh, underlying rhythm disturbance, and I always prefer to do the ablation first and then have uh, the occlusion of the left atrial appendage done in a second step. Uh, I don't know what uh, device you are planning to use, uh, Horst. Yeah. Of course, if you take an agar device and the disc is covering the ridge between the pulmonary veins, we nicely see the pulmonary veins there then you have a, a problem in isolating the uh, PVs. So um, we are planning a study now to randomize patients um, with persistent atrial fibrillation into isolation of the pulmonary veins plus lariat device in the same procedure. So not what uh, the EMAs trial is doing, doing that stepwise, but we want to do it in the same procedure and then randomize into a control group. So that, that is the only question. I'm not sure yeah. that you did uh, consider to have an uh, ablation. I mean, I know that you're using the cryo balloon host. So would that be something that um, uh, you would consider in general? And there are specific reasons that you didn't do it here. Uh, what yeah. is the strategy? Or you leave it open for the future? I'm completely with you. But this patient uh, actually is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, but she, he doesn't really recognize it, so it's kind of asymptomatic. Nevertheless, I think your strategy is the right one, but in our current system, that doesn't work yet. Um, financially? Financially, well, uh, uh, insurance-wise, so that's our yes. problem here. But I agree. Medically, I'm absolutely on your side. Any other questions or comments? Well, following on from that, is that now going to influence the device you're going to use? 
Well, I, uh, you will see that I will most likely not cover the Pomeroy Ridge. And uh, Karl-Heinz, even if it is covered, I think at least a uh, regular cryo balloon would not be a problem, right? Yeah, with the cryo, probably, probably not, despite the fact that, of course, we love the cryo balloon specifically to isolate the ridge because the ridge is the most critical part of any ablation procedure, and particularly if you use a point-to-point -point radio frequency catheter. So that's my, my preference is to do the isolation first and then in a secondary step um, uh, then uh, to implant the device. So uh, again, what device are you going to use? Uh, uh, the LifeTech device, that's what we're considering here. And uh, I'm most likely we will not cover the orifice, but uh, it's, a, it's a very well taken point, so we should take this into consideration in the future. Uh, so I'm ready to do the transeptal puncture, and I would like to ask uh, Iduna to give me a long axis yeah. view of the interatrial septum. Mm -hmm. uh, host uh, um, Antonio Colombo, uh, question. Hi, Antonio. Um, yeah. Would be, w I understand the value of TE. Uh, don't you think it would be really uh, for the future uh, to find the device uh, and an approach to do this procedure totally without uh, uh, TE uh, with the patient uh, not necessarily needing uh, intubation. Yeah. yeah, well, we don't do intubation anyway. So yeah, this, I uh, know, but that's, uh, such that's a, a feature sedation. of, uh, yeah. of <laughs> Germany, but uh, in many <laughs> other parts of Italy the world. Italy is different, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, I mean, uh, uh, although, I mean, you still have to rule out thrombus in the appendage. Uh, and you certainly can discuss now whether CT is uh, capable to do that. Uh, but independent from that, of course, it would be valuable to have a device which is... So, so I'm putting back for, the needle. For future developments for Absolutely. the industry to find the device... Absolutely, yeah. That, uh, and then we can find, need, uh, and then we can figure out how to rule out thrombus. I'm absolutely, I absolutely agree. It uh, should be the next step. So I pulled back the needle. Now I'm in the inferior part of the septum. You see this on the left side of the echo images, and I'm also in the mid septum. Uh, I go a little bit more posterior for that reason. Even though it's on the right side, the outer or the left. Okay, so, so I'm in the posterior part. I'm in the posterior mm -hmm. part. So that's a good, a good okay. area to puncture. So Horst, you are using, you are using the echo images now to guide uh, the transeptal puncture in exactly. the sense that you want to be inferior and posterior, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, regarding uh, the question uh, that uh, you just mentioned regarding the uh, one we call one stop uh, first ablation, then afterwards mm -hmm. the uh, left appendage occlu occlusion, and uh, the condition is uh, the left HM not too, too, too big. When, the, for example, the left HM is uh, too, uh, uh, too big, uh, could this be uh, a, a, a issue or be directed to the left appendage occlusion? We do not do ablation. Well, if the left HM is really big, and that means more than six centimeters, then there are no data to support the left appendage closure. And some people say, well, if that HM is so large, then there's also risk of yeah, this is the question the I put on Karl Heinz, actually. Okay. Yeah. So I will de-air the sheath now and give heparin, but continue, please. Yeah. I think that we don't have enough data to answer that question. You know, what is the risk of a big left atrium? Um, and what is the risk of fibrosis itself within the left atrium? I mean, there are many people that, that do believe that the more fibrosis you have, the higher the risk of stroke is. But of course, they are not too many prospective randomized data that, that can guide us here. Um, uh, but I fully agree with you, you know. Uh, I think that the risk of um, a stroke clearly correlates to the size of the left atrium. I think left atrial size is a risk factor by itself, and uh, fibrosis may be an additional risk factor. So I would take that into consideration, of course. Horse, going back to the practicalities, I mean, you just did a very beautiful transeptal puncture coming down and poking and so on. Maybe some people missed it. And you're doing some technical stuff of putting a short sheath in the long sheath. Could you explain why you're yeah. doing that? So the short sheath is just because I'm using the Medtronic transeptal system. That has a bad valve here. It's a, this sheath is actually older than, than I am. So that's why the valve is not perfect. And the, uh, I'm just inserting the six French sheath. Uh, you show my hands, please. I'm just inserting the six French sheath into the transeptal in order to have no bleeding when I insert the pigtail. So this is now the next step. It's a f uh, four French angled pigtail 
it has to be four French because that is a smaller tail and angled so I can direct it towards the appendage. And think on fluoro, it should be in the appendage. Laura, uh, uh, Laura can you show me yeah. where the picture you are is? In the I, it's in the appendage, okay. Mm -hmm. So now I would yeah. like I to do an initial. I think this is a very nice maneuver, mm -hmm. makes the procedure safer. Mm, yeah. So I will do initial angiogram here. Uh, let's first uh, isocentric calibration in this machine here. So we have to go to the uh, LAO and RAO to make sure that. You know, Horse, one, one question. There is, yes. a, there is a new transeptal cheese uh, from transeptal solutions. That cheese has a loop wire that you can um, extend and you come from below and then you extend the loop wire and it takes you to the fossa. Mm -hmm. And then you can do the puncture, you can do the puncture and then once you go across the septum you can really again extend that loop wire and mm -hmm. then guide the loop wire into the left atrial appendage uh, safely, so that uh, prevents you from using what you are what you are doing now. What we also do, if we are not using this, to put a, a catheter, a pigtail catheter, into the left atrial appendage. Have That's you have you seen this device? No, I have have not you used seen it? it? Which which company is it? Transeptal Solutions. Okay. So we should make a note. So now I am doing an angiogram here. This is areo cordal projection. Okay, so it's a little bit diluted contrast, but I think you can see it. So uh, let me do some measurements here. Sorry, Horst, did yeah. I get it right? If uh, you, s you see a small wing, you rather take the four French uh, pigtail? No, always. Uh, always. Always. Four French, yeah. The tail is smaller than with the five French, a little bit, so it, it's easier to get into the appendage with this one. So you have F17, which is very much consistent with the echocardiographic measurements. So we have about between 17 and 19 in the different modalities and different planes. Uh, <clears throat> let's now decide about the size of the device. We have a sizing chart here on the wall. A question. Oh, you can see this. <coughs> May I ask Please. A question? Yeah, this is uh, Apostolos Zikas. Uh, uh, Hello. Um, when you have the differences between angio and echo, which one do you trust? <laughs> I always uh, go for the largest measurement, whatever it is, uh, okay. echo or T. But I mean, it's it's not only that I'm I'm not trusting one or the other technique. The question is. The problem is to predict where the device will land, and this defines where you have to measure. Uh, I think here it's pretty obvious the landing zone is that, but sometimes it's, it's difficult and it depends also upon the, the angle of the sheet. Now let's look at the sizing chart. So with the Lambda device or the LifeTech device, there are two device configurations, the regular one and those for bilobed appendages. This one has a small distal part and a big proximal part, whereas this is here like in other devices. And here you can see the landing zone. We said we have about 16 to 18 or 19, so we are in this range here. Uh, that means we can go for uh, either 22, 28 or 24, 30 device. So th uh, 30 or 28 means the uh, cover of the device, whereas the 22 and 23 refers to the diameter of the distal part. They call the distal part umbrella and this one here the cover. So it's a little bit confusing because other companies use different terms for the same thing. Are there any Lambra users in the audience? Well, Horst, uh, we'll take questions as you work if there are any because uh, Copenhagen want us to go over there in under 10 minutes. Okay, then let's go for, uh, let's go for actually this one here, the 2430. 2430. And I need a long sheath, and I need an amplex extra stiff. So the lumber device goes through a, a 10 French sheath. Actually, the smaller size goes even to an 8 or 9 French, but we only use the 10 French. This is a little but but sometimes important advantage. Sometimes it's actually difficult to get into the groin with a very big sheath. Is oh. this a special angled sheath or? Yeah, it's like a double curve like, like well, most of the other devices right. as well. 
Or I will show you in a second the curve. Of does the it matter in your experience whether the patient is in AD fibrillation if you size or whether the patient is in sinus rhythm? We believe that if it is in, uh, uh, in sinus rhythm, then we should oversize a little bit. Uh, but I don't have really the data to support that. It's more like gut feeling. Uh, what is also important is the filling pressure in the uh, left atrium. Did we check zero here? Not really, huh? We have to do this. No, uh, that's what I. That's what I'm referring to. Yeah. If the patient is in AD fibrillation, then of course, most of the time, you would expect that the the size of the left uh, atrial appendage as of the left atrium is bigger as uh, compared if the patient is in sinus rhythm. Um, but I know there is no very good data to yeah. to demonstrate or to show whether that has any effect on the sizing um, of the devices. But it's, it's just the, the clinical curve experience. Of the sheath, so this is one curve in one direction. I rotate around, and then you see that there's a second curve which is actually pointing anteriorly. So that's why it's called double curve. So and uh, now I'm inserting the Amplats extra stiff wire into the... I ex like to exchange the uh, uh, pigtail with the wire in the appendage. Others prefer to, to do this with the wire in the pulmonary vein. Both options are good options. Uh, you just have to pay attention when you do it with my technique, then you should have a little loop of the wire in the appendage so that the uh, wire behaves like a pigtail catheter. The implantation of this uh, Lambry device is a little bit different from the watchman because watchman normally will put this sheath in this appendage and mm -hmm. by pushing and we pull back this, uh, this sheath. Yeah. But this is a Lambry device, normally we put this sheath just by the entrance. We push mm -hmm. it in, it, it jump with the umbrella out, and the cover will automatically cover the entrance. It's a mm -hmm. little bit different. We not, not necessarily put this chest in the left, uh, uh, in the uh, appendage. Yeah, that's correct. I still prefer to have the wire in the appendage, which uh, makes it easier to direct the sheath towards sure, the appendage. Sure, yeah. But uh, it's a good point. So you could also consider to actually exchange <coughs> the pigtail just in the middle of the left atrium and then go from there, so that would, this would also be an option uh, sometimes. Uh, host, ask a question, it's not related to the procedure. Mm -hmm. Normally, we have a team working on this uh, very complex procedure. You're working everything or are you alone? Yeah, oh, this yeah, is not a very uh, complex I've complete been, procedure. I've huh? been very enthused uh, to see you working alone. <laughs> I think that's the most in interesting part of the procedure. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we have the privilege here to see two monitors, live monitors. You see Horst on his own. On the left monitor, you see five or six people in the room. So, Horst. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you, if you need somebody, we should send somebody over from Rotterdam. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. it's, not, it's not fair because I could not do this procedure without the help of Ilona, who's doing the, uh, the echo. But uh, Horst. Uh, yeah, but I, I think, think uh, the trouble is if somebody was working with Horst, it'd probably slow him down. So <laughs> You have to be more... Yeah, you don't have to foster unemployment. Eh? He fixed the wire by himself. He <laughs> punctured, he'd do everything by himself, huh? Horst, one question to this cheese. Is it yeah. a braided cheese? Because uh, the torque control of the watchman cheese is very, very poor. And um, it's very easy to overbend the watchman cheese because of this poor torque control. I don't know uh, the technology, but it's uh, pretty, pretty good stirable. So, I so it looks I like, if yeah. I see that you're doing quite some torquing, it looks like that this probably is a braided cheese. So I did this, talk, uh, this uh, turning around torquing because I had problems to go through the septum, which is now solved. Now I keep the dilator in place and advance the uh, sheath a little bit more. Again, we don't have to really push it deeply into the appendage, but it's easier to do the exchange when the, yeah. device, the sheath but, uh, is over there. Uh, what I do a little bit different as soon as I am in the <coughs> left atrium uh, with the sheet and dilator, I remove the dilator and I progress uh, with the pigtail. Catherine? Uh, yeah. With the pigtail, uh, uh, rather. Uh. How is the anticoagulation now, Horst? Do, do, uh, uh, what I is give, the ACT uh, value? Yeah, I give ten, uh, ich brauche Druckinfusion und uh, uh, das Device, uh, was wir bereitgelegt haben. Horst, there are Action. two radio opaque markers on the sheath at the end. Uh, yeah, could you just explain yeah. what their purpose is? Because you've already know. sized. I don't know. It's. Uh, I, I think you can you can use this for calibration, but I 
don't like to do that because uh, if you do this, then you have to really make sure that you are perpendicular to the X-ray beam. So I, I do ISO calibration instead. Let me explain the device. We are preparing a, a pressure infusion now, it's something you need for this device, which is specific and uh, different from the other devices. So you see the distal part, and they call this umbrella. And they have the proximal part, which uh, is called the cover. The proximal part has a screw hole to be connected to the little cable. And you see that inside of this device, you see big hooks. Can you see that? No. Yeah. The secret these, is. these big hooks uh, help to make sure that the device does not uh, fall out. But really, the hooks which engage in the tissue are these small hooks which are just here. They are really small, very difficult to see. So if you want to see them, you probably have to go to the, to the booth uh, of the company where they can show it to you. So now, um, uh, here comes the delivery cable, which is comparable to the other delivery cables. Also, who makes uh, this device? Which is the company? Uh, LifeTech. Uh, LifeTech Life in Shenzhen, in China. In yeah. Chinese. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can see that in uh, Copenhagen, they would like us to go. Um, quite soon, so yeah, I hurry up here. Uh, so Dr. Lim from Hong Kong, he develop, developed this device uh, because uh, we do find uh, after uh, the occluded some uh, uh, residual uh, leakage uh, by the entrance, and therefore he developed this uh, the disc this cover. Oh, I made a mistake. Huh? I screwed it on yeah, before first, I yeah, inserted. Yeah, first, first you have yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, I have to. <laughs> that is interesting technology. <laughs> yeah, you first. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, would have been. I mean, you can push hard to do this. Then, put this in only, we put it in, you know, in the water yeah. in saline. Yeah. Horst, there seems to be a lot of space in this device. Um, is there special, any special technique for flushing it? Or? Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. I mean it's, uh, it's actually when it goes through the sheath, where's the pressure line? Here it is. Uh, we have to insert, uh, uh, to use a pressure line uh, with saline, because otherwise you will have air in the system. So that's an important difference to the other devices where you usually don't have to flush the, the sheath during the phase when you insert it. Okay. Yes. Good. Let me just connect here and unbitter. And I can also use this obviously to yes. flush the device no, when yeah. it is loaded. Okay. Like yes. It's very important. Uh, Host, yeah. um, the pressure me to go over to Copenhagen. Hoax, it's very so tiny. You can retrieve it. Yeah, see? Okay. When you are not happy. Mm. So, so let's, uh, so let's confirm just move the position of the sheath. It's correct. I go out with the sheath and the wire together. It's important to keep the hub of the sheath below zero to make sure that we have back bleeding. I don't see back bleeding yet, so let me... Uh, maybe I'm touching the tissue. I'm pulling back the sheet a little bit. Now again. Huh. No blood is coming. Uh, so I actually, the, the, the pressure is very low. I think you, you have to, to uh, pull it, not uh, just. OK, now it comes, yeah. Well, OK. So I have back bleeding. I connect. Yeah, left atrial pressure is rather low here, so that's why I had difficulties to de air. You can aspirate, but with aspiration, sometimes you get additional air in. Also, the regular lure lock doesn't fit, so you would have to use the, uh, the yeah. valve, which has then a lure lock attached. You cannot just attach a syringe to Ho the Horse, top. a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find the feature of uh, this device uh, that you can come from outside, from the left atrium, inside, instead of having your sheath there helpful? Yeah. Let me explain this in a second. We, we should continue with the procedure because they are waiting there. So uh, now you see that I pull back the sheath a little bit. You see these little markers coming out. Uh, and I would like to see the device on echo as well. Yeah, I'm in the, at the ostium of the device, not deeply in. I will uh, push it out a little bit further until these little hooks are bending backwards, like that. And now I can push the whole thing in and completely deploy it. I come back to your question in a second. Yeah. Yeah. 
now the disc coming this, out. Uh, some, sometimes we see this distortion of the disc. It's like a Copa phenomenon. Those of you doing ASD closer, they know what I mean. So now I have reconfigured it. Horst, uh, can you cine that so we can see it a little bit better? Because we're not seeing the fluoro that well. Okay. Oh, that's very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So now I can uh, attach contrast. So advantages are that you can deploy it from the beginning of the, uh, of the uh, from the ostium is uh, first you don't have to engage it deeply, so the less risk of perforation. You can also consider the procedure even if there is some suspicion of thrombus distally. Okay. So I just reconfigured it a little bit, and now we are ready to do. Uh, andrographic control, but it's important to connect the contrast to the sheath. Can you do this? Let me fill the sheath with contrast. Okay, okay there we are. Okay, and that looks uh, not too bad to me. So, right. coming back to uh, the point from Karl Heinz. So, uh, and that's what I'm aiming for, for other reasons, is I'm not trying to cover the uh, orifice, really. So there would still be space in the pulmonary ridge. I'm assuming, Karl Heinz, can you correct me if I'm wrong, that you still have place to do ablations in that area. Is that correct? It certainly looks that way on the echo. Yeah. So, Horst, can we, are you going to do a tuck test and then release, and then we'll go over to Copenhagen? Yeah, okay, we'll do that. Thank Just you. a tuck test, I do this on the center. This device never embolizes, and now I'm ready to release it. Ah. Okay, and final ah. angiographic control. Ah. Okay, that looks good. Ah. That looks okay, wonderful. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> Panel? It's pretty straightforward. Well done. Well, that Thank was a wonderful case. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. We'll also go over to Copenhagen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.